um, the role of our immigration system in helping us to recruit and retain talent from around the world and the work of the Biden administration intended to make our immigration system uh, more predictable <clears throat> and to provide clarity for international STEM uh, scholars, students, and researchers from around the world. The Biden administration announced a handful of actions in January of this year intended to help us welcome and retain uh, new talent from abroad and to help us to maintain our global competitive advantage. We will learn more about the work <clears throat> that went into developing and implementing those policy changes, uh, the substance of those actual changes, and what they mean in practice throughout this program. We're grateful to to have so many of you all join us today for this presentation. My name is Jorge Lauri and I'm the Managing Director of Programs with the American Immigration Council in Washington. For those in our audience who may, may be new to the organization and our work, the American Immigration Council has worked for 35 years to, to shape how America and Americans think and act towards immigrants and immigration and work toward the, the goal of building a more fair and just immigration system. At the council, we, we believe that immigrants are a key part of our national fabric and that they bring energy and skills that benefit all of us. <clears throat> we envision an America that values fairness and justice for all immigrants and advances a prosperous future for all of us. Uh, we are fortunate to have a highly distinguished panel of experts with us today with deep expertise on issues relating to high-skilled immigration. And following our discussion, we will have time to answer some of your questions. Members of the audience who, who uh, may wish to submit a question should do so using the Q&A function at the bottom of your screens in Zoom. <clears throat> Before we begin, though, I would like to note for our audience today that this event is not intended for members of the media. The event is not for press purposes, and any information shared here is not for attribution. With that, though, um, it's my pleasure to, to introduce our panelists today. We are joined by Amy Nice, the Assistant Director for International Science and Technology Workforce with the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy. She joined the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy in June of 2021. And for over 30 years, she has worked as an immigration lawyer focused on a wide variety of employment-based immigration-related issues uh, in private practice for more than 20 years. And since 2010, as a policy analyst, an advocate, and a thought leader. We are also joined by Stephen Yale Lair. He is the co-author of Immigration Law and Procedure, the leading immigration law treatise published by LexisNexis. He's also a professor of immigration law practice at Cornell Law School and is of counsel at Miller, Mayer, and Ithaca, New York. Uh, for many years, he chaired or was a member of the Business Immigration Committee for AILA. He has testified many times before Congress and is frequently quoted in the media. <clears throat> He received Ayla's Elmer Freed Award for Excellence in Teaching in 2001 and Ayla's Edith Lowenstein Award for Excellence in the Practice of Immigration Law in 2004. And finally, we're joined by Dan Berger. Dan is a partner at the immigration law firm of Curran, Berger & Klutt in Northampton, Massachusetts. He's on the uh, Legal Advisory Board of the President's Alliance on Immigration and Higher Education and a member of the Ayla USCIS Liaison Committee. He is a frequent writer and speaker on immigration issues, including after the 2020 election for the Brookings Institution on recommendations for the Biden-Harris administration, and also on strategies to support international entrepreneurs. He recently co-edited an updated publication um, on the immigration options for academics and researchers. Okay, before we begin, I would like to note a couple of quick housekeeping items. First, today's webinar will be recorded, and we will email that recording to everyone in attendance, as well as those who registered but were not able to join us today. And secondly, members of the audience will be muted throughout the webinar. Again, if you have a question for our speakers, please make sure to submit your question through the Q&A function on your screen. We will do our best to answer as many of the questions as possible later in the program. Okay, with that, let's let's jump right in. So, Amy, STEM workers um, they they play an, an increasingly important role in the U.S. economy. They're, they're critical to our innovation. They're responsible for many of the cutting edge uh, ideas and technologies that create jobs across the country. And the role of immigrants in STEM fields cannot be overstated. Our research at the council has found that as of 2019, immigrants made up almost a quarter of all STEM workers in the U.S., meaning that 
our ability to continue to, to continue to be a leader on innovation depends to a great extent on our ability to recruit talent from abroad, um, at least from the council's perspective. So against that backdrop, could you please share why the, the Biden administration um, became interest, interested in doing something on STEM immigration and what led up to the series of changes that were announced um, earlier this year? First, thanks for having me. Um, to start, uh, the, the reason the Biden-Harris administration got interested in STEM immigration actually reflects a vision this administration had from the outset about recognizing that STEM immigration policy is a science and technology policy. As such, the Biden administration was the first administration to have an interest in securing a STEM immigration expert to be resident in the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy. More specifically, in March 2021, the Biden-Harris administration announced interim national security strategic guidance that focused on three principles, protect the security of the American people, expand economic prosperity and opportunity, and realize and defend American values. These same three priorities are reflected in the administration's national security strategy announced October 12th. It's, it's interim no more. From the outset, the administration started with the idea that vital to these three core national security objectives was a need to attract more international STEM talent and develop more domestic STEM talent, two sides of the same coin. Indeed, attracting more global STEM talent to the United States is one of the central pillars of this administration's strategy for technology excellence and economic competitiveness that will benefit working people and communities across the country. Among other reasons, this is why the Biden-Harris administration has been focused on policy shifts that could enhance attracting international STEM talent to our country. <clears throat> As we like to say in our corner of the White House, one of America's most amazing superpowers is that we are a leading magnet for talented scientists and engineers from around the world. Many outside analysts and national security experts have pointed out that this might be our only asymmetric advantage in driving toward those three national security objectives, security of Americans, economic prosperity for Americans, and the open sharing of ideas and promoting democratic ideals prized by Americans. So I've been looking at finding nooks and crannies in our existing immigration system and existing authorities of departments and agencies that might enhance our ability to attract and retain more international STEM talent. Necessarily, the thinking behind the White House efforts on STEM talent with our agency colleagues at state and DHS have been to develop agency level policy actions. I'm a baseball fan, so I'm gonna say we are engaging in a game of small ball. We wanna score runs, but we are not hitting for the fences to do it. So what combination of actions are we relying on? It wasn't hit and run, bunting, stolen bases, and singles, but there have been four elements. First, look at areas where no change in statute or regulation is required. Second, recognize the value of more certainty and predictability standing alone. Third, prioritize the nation's research and development enterprise in academia, industry, and government. <coughs> and last, pay special attention to international students and fellows coming to the United States. First, if we're going to be laser focused on getting things done, we have to limit ourselves where no change in statute or regulation is required. That's because it's exceedingly difficult to get Congress to act, not that the administration has given up on that. And because notice and comment rulemaking is a two plus year process typically, not that the administration isn't pursuing rulemaking in the high skilled immigration space. It turns out there are several nooks and crannies where we have current authorities permitting us to act. These are related to advanced STEM degree holders. And so that is where we have focused so far. Second, another part of our small ball approach has been recognizing that the lack of predictability in our immigration system itself creates a chilling effect on international STEM experts. 
and we discovered there were several areas where departments and agencies had never issued policy guidance explaining how certain immigration classifications might apply to advanced STEM degree holders. The thought was that if we put enough meat on the bone in new guidance to provide useful detail, then such policy shifts could be consequential in the aggregate because they provide the same guidance to agency adjudicators and the public. The idea is that new policy guidance might stimulate demand from foreign-born advanced STEM degree holders in certain visa classifications, even though the standards are not being changed and instead just explained especially where objective measures can be provided on how advanced STEM degree holders might qualify. Third, STEM R&D is very much tied to those three national security objectives, security of Americans, economic prosperity for Americans, and the open sharing of ideas prized by Americans. That's the very reason the National Science Foundation exists, because it was well understood 70 years ago that all of those national security objectives are tied to a robust science and engineering workforce and science and engineering activity. Over the last 70 years that NSF has been reporting on R&D funding, pretty dramatic changes have occurred, both with regard to basic and fundamental science research, as well as to applied and experimental research and development in the sciences and engineering. In 1953, when the NSF first started tracking the nation's R&D expenditures, the federal government funded about 54% of the nation's STEM R&D with 43.5% funded by business and 2.5% funded from other sources, including nonprofit grant-making organizations. In 2020, which is the most recent year for which science and engineering indicators data is assembled, Business funds 73% of the nation's STEM R&D with 19.5% funded by the federal government and 7.5% funded from other sources, including nonprofit grant-making organizations. Moreover, today, businesses fund and perform about 90% of all experimental STEM development in the United States and approaching 60% of U.S applied STEM research. In addition, industry now funds about 32% of basic research in the United States, basic uh, STEM research in the United States, uh, but does not perform most of that research itself, instead relying on partners in academia. Last, in our search for nooks and crannies, we know there are about 14,000 foreign-born graduate students on non-immigrant visas that receive a STEM PhD from a US university each year, almost all from universities that expend in excess of $25 million annually on R&D. We know that if we include the fields eligible for STEM OPT participation, we see about 45,000 international grad students earn STEM masters annually at top research institutions in the United States. And we also know that about 35,000 foreign-born and mostly foreign-educated STEM PhDs are in the U.S. each year completing a postdoctoral fellowship in a STEM field, mostly at the nation's top research universities. We think there's some untapped demand there. And contributions from these advanced STEM degree holders are demonstrably important. We know that foreign-born STEM experts are key to our economic prosperity by a number of measures. The Science and Technology Policy Institute, STIPI, it publicly shared a report in December 2021 that was commissioned by OSTP to quantify some of the economic costs and benefits for our country from such advanced foreign-born STEM experts. STIPI found, among other things, that 16 to 24% of founders of high technology companies are foreign born, that high tech companies founded by foreign born entre entrepreneurs may account for 1.2 to 1.8% of GDP in the United States, and that through their contributions to increased total factor productivity, the foreign born STEM workforce in the United States generates an estimated $37 billion annually to US GDP. In short, 
enhancing opportunities for international STEM talent and expanding STEM immigration are vital to changing the equation in technology competition, in industrial policy, and in, and in the exchange of perspectives in R&D, and thus are directly tied to those three national security objectives I listed at the top and have repeated, security of Americans, economic prosperity for Americans, and the open sharing of ideas, an important democratic ideal prized by Americans. And as articulated in the recent national security strategy, the Biden-Harris administration is committed to continuing to take measures to ensure the United States remains the world's top destination for talent. To date, the executive office of the president has looked with our agency colleagues for such measures where no change in statute or regulation is required, where we could provide more certainty through policy level actions, and where we could help support R&D and opportunities for international students. To be clear, it is the departments and agencies that write and implement policy level guidance, not the White House. And it takes an ongoing and collaborative effort. OSTP has been working closely with colleagues across the executive office of the president, especially the National Security Council and the Domestic Policy Council. And most importantly, with amazingly committed and knowledgeable colleagues in bureaus in the State Department and component agencies of the Department of Homeland Security, in particular U.S. Citizenship and Immigration Services, to engage in a focused effort to affect policy level changes relating to attracting and retaining international STEM talent. We think the Biden administration's policy shifts announced by the Departments of Homeland Security and State are good news for foreign-born students, scholars, researchers, and professionals in the sciences and engineering and for their employers in academia, industry, and government, across sectors and geographies in our country. We're hopeful that the five announced policies will, at least in the aggregate, be consequential in messaging the commitment of the United States to welcome foreign-born STEM experts and providing more certainty about how this welcome mat will work. Um, now our other panelists will talk a bit about the new international STEM talent policies announced by the administration by summarizing the policies and identifying some examples of how the policies might help in the real world. Jorge, I'll turn it back to you. Thank you, Amy. Uh, I find the background of the inner workings of the White House on these issues to be rather fascinating, so I appreciate all that. Um, like you mentioned, let's shift over to the substance of the changes now that um, the changes that the administration announced in January, and I'd like to turn to Stephen uh, for that. Stephen, could you please walk us through a, a summary of each of the, the changes that the Biden administration made earlier this year? Sure. So Amy explained why the Biden administration made these changes. I'm going to explain what those five changes are and then go into them a little more de detail, and then Dan Berger will explain how the administration has implemented those changes and what they mean for people on this webinar. But as Amy noted, these are changes in the nooks and crannies of immigration law. Um, if you're not familiar with Cornell University, that's a screenshot of Cornell University behind me and uh, Cayuga Lake. We're high above Cayuga's waters for those of you who know the alma mater of Cornell. Of the five changes made by the government last January, two are by the State Department and three are by the Department of Homeland Security. In quick summary, I'll list what the five changes are, and then I'll go into more detail on each of the five changes. First, the Department of State started an early career STEM research initiative <clears throat> to try to make it easier for non-immigrant exchange visitors in the J-1 non-immigrant visa category to engage in STEM research through research or training or cultural exchange visitor programs with organizations that include companies and universities and chambers of commerce. Second, the State Department extended academic training, which allows J-1 workers to work in the United States after they graduate. And now if you are an undergraduate or pre postdoctoral graduate student in the J-1 area, in the STEM area, uh, you can work for periods of up to three years or 36 months. Third, the Department of Homeland Security added 22 new STEM fields, including bioenergy and cloud computing and data science that are now on the official STEM list so that by studying in those areas, international students can 
work in the United States after they graduate for up to three years. By contrast, international F1 students who graduate with non-STEM degrees can only work in the United States for one year after they graduate. Fourth, the Department of Homeland Security issued guidance uh, in its so-called USCIS policy memo, sorry, manual, related to extraordinary ability O1A non-immigrant visa petitions regarding what evidence may satisfy the evidentiary criteria for that category. And fifth, Department of Homeland Security issued an update to its policy manual on how STEM workers might qualify more easily for national interest waiver green cards. Now, as Amy mentioned, these may appear sort of minor, you know, not a new law, not a regulation change, just some changes to a policy manual, whatever that is. But together, these administrative changes do provide a significant step to, follow, to help US companies keep competitive in the global economy. To follow up on Amy's metaphor, these are singles that can add up to a home run. So let's look at those five changes in a little more detail. And here is the meat on the bone that Amy mentioned. First, the State Department's Early Career STEM Research Initiative. What is that? Well, basically it tries to help US companies who are interested in hosting J-1 exchange visitors to match them with J-1 program sponsors. As background, a J-1 is a temporary non-immigrant visa category issued to so-called exchange visitors. And there are 15 uh, J-1 exchange visitor categories, including interns and trainees and au pairs and research scholars and research professors. They come in through J-1 sponsors like universities or companies. So this new State Department initiative uses seven of the 15 existing categories with the aim of attracting exchange visitors in STEM fields, whether they're college and university students or professors or research scholars, short-term research scholars, interns, trainees, and specialists. So say a US company wants to host an exchange visitor in one of these categories, now they can submit a statement of interest to the State Department's Bridge USA website. Just type in Bridge USA uh, State Department and you'll get there. The statement will, should specify that the company plans to offer quality STEM and research opportunities in the non-citizens respective field of study and interest. Similarly, an exchange visitor can submit a statement of interest showing that they have an intent to sponsor exchange visitors for quality STEM training in the United States. What then happens next is a Bridge USA will use those statements of interest to connect the host companies with potential J-1 sponsors. While submission of a statement of interest may streamline the process, it's not required. So J-1 organizations that the State Department has already authorized to sponsor exchange visitors in one of these seven categories do not need a separate authorization to sponsor exchange visitors under this new initiative. Sponsors who connect with host companies uh, that the U Bridge USA provides can have to still follow their normal internal procedures for determining if the placement meets the objectives and regulatory requirements of the J-1 program. So that's the early career program. Second, let's talk about the second State Department initiative, and that is to expand the number of months that J-1s in STEM fields can work. This is called academic training after they graduate. The new initiative means that now they can work for up to three years after they graduate instead of the normal 18 month limit that other pre-doctoral J-1 college and university students can work if they're not in a STEM field. Third, the Department of Homeland Security added 22 new STEM fields to a list of approved STEM degrees. These include things like bioengineering and cloud computing and data science. This means that international students who graduate in one of these STEM fields now can work in the United States for up to three years after they graduate. The added fields of study designated as STEM are primarily new multidisciplinary or emerging fields. And as Amy mentioned, they're critical to attract talent to support US economic growth and technological competitiveness. 
This means that more STEM students now can stay in the United States and work for up to three years after they graduate rather than the normal one year limit that non-STEM F1 students have. Fourth, the Department of Homeland Security issued an update to the USCIS policy manual related to extraordinary ability O1A non-immigrant status visa petitions. These are the so-called Einstein visas. And the new criteria help to show what the criteria should be if you want to show that you're extraordinary in a STEM field. And as Amy mentioned, we're trying to put meat on the bones by giving examples of evidence that can actually satisfy the O1A evidentiary criteria. And, and the policy manual now also discusses considerations that are relevant to evaluating such evidence. So for example, they say, what happens if I don't have an outstanding award, but I've got comparable evidence? Can I submit that? So by having more clarity and more examples in the policy manual, it should make it easier for people who are graduating in STEM fields to decide whether they might actually get one of the so-called Einstein O1A visas. Fifth, the uh, USCIS issued an update to its policy manual on how STEM workers can qualify more easily for national interest waiver green cards. As background, when an employer wants to sponsor a foreign national employee for a green card, normally they have to go through a labor market test known as labor certification, where they advertise and then the Department of Labor vets them to make sure that there are no US workers willing, able, and available to do that job. That can be time consuming. Now, employers can already bypass or waive the labor certification test if the employee's work is in the national interest. That's why we call it a national interest waiver. The USCIS policy manual updates clarifies how the national interest waiver can be used for people with advanced degrees in STEM fields and entrepreneurs. So for example, they added a section to their policy manual with specific evidentiary considerations they look favorably now with people on a PhD in a STEM field where the work has potential to further a critical and emerging technology or other STEM area that's important to US competitiveness or national security. And they provide examples now of how adjudicators can identify a critical and emerging technology, such as looking at lists of technologies published by the National Science and Technology Council or the National Security Council. Amy mentioned foreign entrepreneurs, and there are a lot of STEM entrepreneurs that want to start their own company. And the USCIS added a section to its policy manual for specific evidentiary considerations for entrepreneurs who are trying to get a national interest waiver. And it clarifies for adjudicators that documentation for entrepreneurs may not follow traditional career paths. There's no single way that you will necessarily structure an entrepreneurial startup. Uh, the guidance explains that relevant information may include ownership and investment records or an entrepreneur's educational degree or experience letters. Or maybe they have awards or grants with, from government entities with research and development expertise. Since many STEM researchers start companies, this is useful. Now to me, of the five changes, the early career STEM research initiative is the most interesting. For example, the term research, what does that mean? Well, it's pretty flexible. It's not defined anywhere. It's not limited to basic research or fundamental research conducted in academia. It can be applied or experimental at a company. Researchers can conduct research. They can observe research. They can consult on research for their host company. Both businesses and academic institutions can use this new early career STEM research initiative. Companies have found in the past that the J-1 researcher category has a lot of flexibility. It's faster and easier and sometimes less expensive to facilitate international and collaborative research. Or maybe chambers of commerce could facilitate a consortium of local businesses that might work together with a single designated sponsor, either the chamber of commerce or a university for the most efficient and cost-effective way to attract researchers to a given area. A research scholar in a specific area of research may have multiple sites of activity, and they don't have to figure that out before arrival under this new initiative. Researchers can now choose their sites where they want to work as their research progresses. 
So it allows researchers to take the time they need and go to where the research is happening. They can follow the science. There's a lot on the American Immigration Council website about this. They have an FAQ. If you just do a Google search for American Immigration Council and federal STEM initiatives, FAQs, you'll get that. And I think we're gonna give a link to this uh, after the fact. So with that as background, I'll turn it over to Dan and he can talk more about how the agencies are actually implementing this new guidance. Thanks, Steve, and thank you to um, Jorge and to the Council for, for sponsoring this event. Um, you know, it, immigration policy over the last few years has just been fast and furious, where, where there's a lot, there's so much information. I, I, I think, so I, I'm really pleased that this webinar is happening to, to really highlight the, some of the initiatives that came out earlier this year. And especially now that we've had about eight or nine months to uh, to, to, to absorb them and, and to see. Sometimes the, the first read wasn't didn't give a really clear idea of what the what the potential and what the possibilities are. Um, again, the big picture, as Amy explained, is that only Congress can create new categories. Um, we'd certainly all, I, I assume, be be in favor of a, a startup visa or a STEM research visa. That would be great. But um, but in the meantime, the administration has has added additional guidance to explain to clarify situations in which certain existing categories can be used. And that, and that is really great. Um, the, the presentation today is higher level. It's to make sure that you understand what these categories are, what's been done, why it's been done, and to, to plant some seeds for, for, future, um, for future thought. Um, as Steve said, the American Immigration Council website has very detailed FAQs that are being continually updated. Um, also, I have to give a lot of credit to the State Department and to Homeland Security for the State Department in the Bridge USA section has very detailed FAQs on the J-1 Early Career STEM Research Initiative in particular, and also the USCIS Policy Manual, which is which is growing in, in very useful ways and does have quite a bit more information. So there's a lot out there. Um, but if you're really looking to explore in depth the, the nooks and crannies that Amy was talking about, um, there, there are other webinars. AILA, the American Immigration Lawyers Association, did one that is, it, I think, is available on recording. NAFSA, I see some of the participants are, are, are with universities. So there, there are other resources in addition to the AIC website. Um, Steve talked a little bit, uh, Steve talked in more detail about the J-1 Early Career STEM Research Initiative. That's that's exciting, and we're again we're we're still figuring out the possibilities there. Um, I'd like to talk a little bit more about the O1 and the National Interest Waiver um, on a to, to show ways in which they they help uh, situations that we faced before. And one way to think about this is um, in, in the in the past before these initiatives, we we would often get calls from either from from postdocs or from from researchers or from comp companies asking to hire somebody. Now, as, as many of you know, the, the H-1B is a, is a lottery that's held once a year, which has a relatively low rate of success right now. Um, and a, a labor certification green card can be, can be slow. Prevailing wages, the first step of a labor certification are taking about nine or 10 months right now and, and may continue to be slow because of statutory requirements that temporary visas be prioritized and the fact that there are more H-2As and H-2Bs right now. So the more, you know, in, in immigration, it's a game of categories. The more choices we have, the more tools we have in our toolbox, the better. Um, the O-1 is for someone who is in the top few percent of his or her field and has sustained a claim. Obviously, that is, that is subjective. In the past, we were... Most immigration lawyers, I believe, did not include certain kinds of evidence because that evidence we found was discounted by the immigration service in RFEs or denials. Um, for example, being uh, no, named on a government grant, um, giving a talk at a meeting. Um, I think we, we would often get RFEs, requests for evidence that would push back and say, well, most academics, you know, give talks at meetings, you know, lots of people are on grants. Why is that special? Um, and the, the new O1 guidance clarifies that those types of activities can be relevant, not necessarily to the, to the initial O1 um, 
determination, but to the final merits determination. So for, for now, an O1 is basically a two-part analysis that you look for specific kinds of evidence that are in the regulations. And then there's a big picture overall final merits, totality of the circumstances, review of the case to see if someone qualifies. And at that point, we can now in 2022 include that other kind of evidence that we did not include before. So we can really add on more of what's on someone's CV. And Steve mentioned that you know, some people call this the Einstein visa. I don't know, um, how many, I noticed there's some ALA members on here. I don't know how, how many of you have actually been part of this exercise, but it, years ago at, at ALA meetings when we were talking about O1s, we would put Einstein's resume up on the on the screen, obviously taking out the year, because that would, you know, if it said 19, 1919, that probably would give it away. Um, but you'd see somebody who, you know, had worked in the patent office and then was a was a lecturer and then, you know, now is a professor and maybe um, had, I think, five or six publications, not a tremendous number of citations, um, and had given some talks at meetings. Uh, and in general, the audience would say, no, nah, you know, let tell them to wait, you know, a few years and then think about the O1. Um, I, I think, you know, the 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 through line of, of I, I believe, of what Amy was saying is that someone like Einstein, I know it's almost sounds silly to say, having him in the US is good for our economic benefit, it's good for public diplomacy, it's good for, for our national security, it's just good to have somebody operating at that level, um, even if that person does not have hundreds or, or thousands of citations. So, so that's really where, um, where the O1 is, and I would encourage anybody working in this space to consider the O1 as an option. And really, you know, I do this all the time. Um, I, I literally look back at the appendix that is in the policy manual be, to see what kinds of evidence is suggested. It's not saying it's not saying we will give you an O1 if you have X, Y, and Z. It's saying these are relevant factors that you can add and I think citing the policy manual. Um, we haven't seen a pattern yet of, um, of uh, you know, denials or officers not understanding, but my, 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 um, my understanding is that there is a, I think a 20% vacancy rate at USCIS. There will be more people added. There can be training issues. So I, I would say, look at that appendix when you're doing a STEM 01 and um, don't hesitate to cite it be just in case the officer is not aware because officers have a lot a lot of training to do. Um, the national interest waiver is a self-petition green card. And again, for those of you who've been doing this a long time, um, I, you can sort of um, track the uh, the approval rates. There have been times over over the 25 years I've been doing this where a relatively high percentage of them are, are approved at, at times where there's a relatively low percentage. The question of who um, who is here in the national interest is is obviously subjective. But in 2016, I, I believe the Obama administration added some additional guidance through Danisar through a, a, an administrative appeals office case that really clarified more about how, especially for entrepreneurs, how somebody could show national importance. Um, and the Biden administration has now done this again in the form of the policy manual by specifically adding situations in which um, STEM research, STEM PhDs can be, can qualify. Um, and I think certainly having a STEM PhD in the first place is, is, a, is a positive factor. And also, I think you, you want to make the connection, you, you want to basically, basically high level uh, STEM PhD show, and then look at the field and try to show that the field is of value, is, is of importance to the government. That can be shown on the critical and emerging technologies list. That can be shown in a variety of other ways that, that are, are mentioned in the guidance and in the FAQs. It could also be shown um, by individual agency funding priorities. So, um, so the, the national importance can be shown in, by, by doing some research. Um, and this gives us an, an ability to have some more confidence in the national interest waiver. There, there was another old AAO case that basically said, well, 20 citations is pretty good for a national interest waiver, but 20 citations means very different things in different fields. And I, I think the, the subjectivity of the national interest waiver did scare people away from using that a little. We are finding that it is a, for STEM 
um, employees that it is now increasingly becoming a, a valuable and not only a self petition, but an, an option for employers in addition to the outstanding researcher category or the labor certification category. And, and I'll, I'll note last that um, Steve just shared this morning, there was a March 18th, 2022 AAO case, Administrative Appeals Office, in which um, a national interest waiver denial was overturned on appeal, specifically citing the STEM guidance. So that's, as far as we know, that is the only AAO case, but it is a good sign that this, that, that this guidance is being followed. So I will, I, I will stop there and we'll make sure we have some time for, for questions, but thank you. Thank you very much, Dan. So let's um, now transition over to the Q&A portion of the program uh, to give members of the audience a chance to raise some of the issues that, that are most pressing to them. Um, Max, can you put the PowerPoint back up on the screen, please, so that we can share those two URLs that were mentioned earlier? So we will actually share this out again, like I mentioned after um, the presentation today, um, but this, this slide contains links to both the council's website um, that has detailed information about these programs and some FAQs, as well as the government's uh, website, USCIS, uh, with greater details um, as well. Um, we, we have a fair number of questions in the queue and obviously won't be able to get to everything. We will do our best to select a number of them that represent a variety of different issues. Uh, once again, just as a reminder, today's discussion is not intended for press purposes. Any information shared here is uh, not for attribution. So I'm just gonna plan to read these questions off and, and you all can please jump in where you see fit. So the first one, we received a number of different questions that speak to this particular issue. Um, and the, the question is, um, with respect to healthcare workers and why they were not included in the, the changes to the official STEM list. Uh, excuse me. Let, let me uh, start off on that. And uh, Dan and Steve, if you have anything to add, of course, that would be excellent. As we were talking, what the administration is focused on with in large degree with regard to STEM talent are existing authorities, existing regulations that are on the books that are binding on the agency. And there is a regulation that defines what is a STEM field for purposes of STEM OPT. And that regulation was finalized during the Obama administration, at the end of the Obama administration and published in March, 2016. And it was effective in May, 2016. That means that unlike the earlier times when the STEM list was updated by uh, the agency making an announcement on its website, that the agency is limited to this definition, the regulatory definition. Now, keep in mind the fact that there was a binding regulation um, had a significant benefit during the prior administration when there was an effort to undo STEM OPT, but they couldn't do it because there's a definition of what's included. So if you look at that definition, you'll see why healthcare, clinical care occupations aren't included. The definition relates to four, um, I'll call them classic uh, science and engineering fields, everything related to math, everything related to engineering, everything in the physical sciences, and everything in the biological and biomedical, um, excuse me, <clears throat> biomedical uh, sciences, but the practice of medicine, nursing, and all the other healthcare occupations are not included in what the Department of Education considers course of study in biological or biomedical sciences. In addition, the STEM OPT field list definition in the regulation includes any field that uses those four areas of activity or computer science to innovate, develop new technologies um, and engage in research. And so the practice of medicine just and other healthcare occupations just don't fall under that definition. And you'll find similarly that the National Science Foundation that says we support all science and engineering activities in America states except for the practice of medicine and healthcare. So it's just a dichotomy that's out there in the world, but also um, 
in the binding regulation that DHS is dealing with. Agreed. And just, just a, a quick footnote to that. Um, although that particular definition is limited, um, I, I think, you know, many of us are lawyers, we can make analogies. So, um, you know, in the, in the context in particular of O1s and, and national interest waivers, um, even though there is talk about STEM PhDs, you know, I think that I think there, there's a good argument by analogy for MDs who are doing who are doing research and to consider that sort of in, in more broadly in the in a in a in the spirit of of STEM research and and to use some of these um, some of this guidance. I definitely think that the administration had in mind that with regard to again the existing statute and regulations that the practice of medicine and clinical um, clinical research um, absolutely is included with regard to O1 status and national interest waiver, but that we were restricted by the content of the regulation with regard to STEM OPT. But I agree, Dan, that that's definitely on the table with regard to other. Thank you both. So the, the next question in the queue um, is about retention. So just reading it verbatim, approximately what percentage of postgraduate STEM foreign students remain to work in the US versus going back to their home countries after receiving their degree? So uh, I can I can respond to that at least initially. Again, you know, maybe Dan or Steve has a perspective um, based on their research and analysis and also you know what they're seeing with regard to clients and you know their other activities. But there's two parts of two part. Uh, I have a two part answer. One is if you look at the STEM OPT participants, so the individuals who get degrees in the United States and remain on for a period of up to three years by requesting a STEM OPT extension, um, about 85% of those individuals have STEM masters or PhDs, <coughs> and that reflects uh, ste about 85% of all STEM OPT participants have STEM masters or PhDs. And that just reflects the fact that um, a very small percentage of STEM bachelor's degrees in America are issued to international students, um, about 6%, but about 50% of all STEM masters and PhDs are issued to international students. However, if you look beyond that three year mark, um, the research shows in general that about 80% of STEM, international STEM PhDs want to stay here, although um, that, that percentage is declining a little bit. Um, and when the analysis looks at about 10 years after earning a PhD, about 80% do ultimately remain in the United States. We might be finding with the backlogs that we have that the, those numbers are gonna decrease. Um, but there's only like this 10 year look back in the way the survey is done of graduate students uh, and that only about 20% of STEM masters are in the past have been able to remain in the United States after the STEM OPT, which is a relatively new program. As you know, the three year um, STEM OPT only went into effect um, in 2016. Thank you, Amy. So the third question on the list is uh, says how how are DHS and other federal agencies vetting foreign STEM students before they come to the U.S.? I'm specifically concerned with students from China and other enemies of the U.S. that threaten our national security. I'll start with that only to give Amy some breathing room here, uh, but she'll probably have more detailed information than I do. I mean, everyone who wants to come to the United States uh, is vetted carefully, whether they're coming as a, a STEM student or otherwise, and um, people have to realize that, and it can take a long time to go through the vetting process. Uh, we, uh, particularly if they're gonna be working in areas that are national concern, national security concern, uh, the processing for their visas may take a lot longer than otherwise. So that is something that we've dealt with for over a hundred years. It's not new to this time and realm. Well, I'll just add very briefly that uh, screening and vetting uh, continues apace and is 
uh, a source of a lot of activity in the White House among many of my colleagues um, in the National Security Council and elsewhere and uh, individuals are screened and vetted uh, pretty deeply and there's a whole uh, partnership of um, agencies that are involved in that uh, endeavor. It is not just the State Department and not just DHS. And if I can add to that, from an immigration lawyer's perspective, many of our complaints from our clients or the STEM researchers is how long it takes to go through the vetting process, and they wish that the government could do a faster job. But you know, the government has to balance the need to bring in the right people versus making sure that the wrong people do not get in. So it's a continuing tension that uh, every administration deals with. Thank you both. So the next question on the list um, it says, can STEM graduates of foreign universities benefit from the national interest waiver policy? Um, I'll, I guess I'll, I'll take that one quickly. The answer is yes. Um, they, they are, I, I would recommend doing an education evaluation just to confirm that it really is a, a STEM PhD, but the, the same logic applies about the value of that person coming to the United States. Thanks, Dan. Okay, question five. Have, have there been any increases in O1A applications after the manual provided clarity? Could O1A be further enhanced by allowing more people to be eligible? Uh, yeah, go ahead, Amy. Oh, I would, um, okay. I, I was just going to say we do have some early data, but it's not public facing that application receipt both receipts and approvals are up with regard to the 01 um, and the national interest waiver category but that's not public facing information as of yet and um uh, obviously um we tried to do all that we could do with regard to meeting the very high statutory standards that control the 01 a category like Steve and Dan referred to, re referred, sometimes people call it the Einstein visa. So like if you're starting with the idea of what does that mean? What's the Einstein standard? It's a, it's a little bit tough. There's not a lot of flexibility there. It's not a category where you can just <coughs> shoehorn in some other individuals who you know we want to prioritize. There's a pretty difficult bar. But what we've tried to do is to say, um, well, you don't have to be Einstein, although I guess if you looked at his actual resume, you might not be so worried. Um, but you don't have to be Einstein. And that's the whole point of providing actual examples and to say, here's some things, you know, while you're on your STEM OPT, STEM PhD person, here are some things that you can do to create the record that you qualify. Um, so I don't know, Dan or Steve, if you have any other thoughts about the second part of that question of whether there are other ways to um, broaden the O1, uh, the O1A categories. Well, in one sense, I mean, the, the criteria are set by Congress in the statute, and then you have regulations by USCIS, and those regulations would need to be changed and not go beyond the statutory criteria. So for the time being, um, we're playing small ball. We're working with the existing regulation and we've got more clarity in the policy manual. Um, many times these things uh, can be done if you're creative, not creative in a bad way, but creative in a good sense. Try to think creatively about the kinds of documentation that can show that the person truly is uh, at the top of their field, even if they just got their PhD or something. So by working with your client or the company or the university, many times um, you can help the person realize their, team, their dream. Sometimes it may be that maybe they don't qualify for an O1A or a national interest waiver right now, but if they do X, Y, and Z over the next 12 months, they may be setting the stage then to have a successful petition. So I encourage people and uh, companies and universities to consult early and often uh, with an experienced immigration lawyer, not wait until they're just about to get their PhD to see what all of the immigration options there might be. 
Thank you both. So we'll try to make our way through two more questions. We're running a bit short on time. Uh, this first one should be relatively quick. Do you have any statistics on USCIS adjudication approval slash RFE request for evidence rates since the, the new policy changes were implemented? Um, what I can tell you is that uh, we over here at the White House have uh, talked talk to USCIS uh, early in the year about data that we wanted and that we have been tracking, including those uh, features that the questioner is identifying. But um, we, the, the information is not publicly available yet, but we are watching those issues, receipts, RFEs, and approvals. Um, and um, hopefully the agency, when the time is right, will share that information publicly. One thing that makes it a little hard is that if you do get an approval, I don't explain you know, why it was approved. So you don't know for sure um, why it was. Whereas if you do get a denial, then they have to list the reasons for the denial and then you can appeal that to the administrative appeals office. So it's a little, it's not as clear as people might like as to whether that the new STEM initiatives are resulting in an increase in the approval rate versus just more people applying. Right, and just, so I know we have one more question, but um, just just quickly, anecdotally, we, we, we are seeing a higher approval rate, although anecdotally we're hearing, particularly from hospitals, of a decline in the approval rate in for medical related cases. Um, again, that's just anecdotal. Please, you know, I, I don't have statistics to back that up. I I think I, I think I would just go back to what I said before when we do talk to hospitals and say, did you um, did you follow the new STEM guidance? You know, I, I, arguably medical research is is a STEM field, so and not, not a STEM field for the for STEM OPT purposes, but medical research is uh, is STEM related. And I think if you follow the the um, the guidance in the in the uh, policy manual, um, I hope that those improve approval rates will improve. Thank you for that, Dan. Um, unfortunately, I think we're going to have to skip the last question. So that this that brings us to the end of our program. Uh, thank you all for joining us here today. Uh, we hope you found the presentation informative and engaging. We have other webinars in the, uh, that are on the schedule for the, the near future, so please join our email list if you haven't already done so, and keep an eye out for those invitations. We would like to thank you all for supporting our work and hope you will continue to do so. We'd like to invite you to visit the Council's website, which is AmericanImmigrationCouncil.org, uh, to subscribe to our updates and check out our extensive resources um, and thanks again for joining us and have a great rest of your day.